Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcasts so you won't miss any of our inspiring content. Here is episode 138. In our constitutional history, men and women have fought for liberty, and every time they stood in unity for liberty, they won. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you are ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Chris Ann Hall. Chris Ann Hall is an attorney and former prosecutor who travels the country teaching the Constitution and the history that gave us our founding documents. Chris Ann will connect the dots for you like no other else can. Host of the Chris Ann Hall Show, she pulls no punches, puts liberty first, and gives no quarter to those who hide behind party labels. Like no other host, Chris Ann will tell you what the founders had to say on today's relevant issues. Chris Ann is a dis abled army veteran, a Russian linguist, a mother, a pastor's wife, and a patriot. Born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, she received her undergrad undergraduate degree in biochemistry from Blackburn College in 1991 and her GD from University of Florida, Levin College of Law, and a former Russian linguist for the U.S. Army. Chris Ann worked as a state prosecutor and with a prominent law firm defending religious liberty and the First Amendment rights. Author of Not Living, Breathing Documents, Reclaiming Our Constitution, and the DVD series The Roots of Liberty, a historic foundation of the Bill of Rights, and bedtime stories for budding patriots and essential stories for junior patriots. She was awarded the Freedom Fighters Award by Americans for Prosperity, the Certificate of Achievement from the Sons of the Revolution for her defense in liberty and Congressman James Blair Award for defending the Constitution. Chris Ann lives in North Florida with her husband, J.C., a pastor and former Russian instructor for the U.S. Navy, and their adopted son, Colin. Welcome, Chris Ann. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm so honored to be here. I am so excited to have you join us on this topic of constitutional education. And this is a great time to be discussing all this with our political things going on. But we are not going to talk necessarily about which political party is the best. We're going to just stick with principles. <laughs> and sadly, unfortunately, learning and studying the Constitution is almost considered an alternative education. <laughs> so it's going to be fun in studying a little bit more in depth on this subject. But before we get started, can you please give our audience some of the background information on yourself and tell us how you came to be so passionate about the Constitution? Well, you know, I wasn't born this way, right? I wasn't from the womb a constitutional champion. As a matter of fact, I uh, knew very little, if anything at all, about the Constitution. And I went to law school and learned what I thought I was learning about the Constitution, and then I started, uh, I just picked up a book called Founding Brothers uh, by Joseph Ellis. And I learned that, you know, history is not boring. And it's not just a bunch of memorizing of dates and names and events. It's actually sort of like real life TV. Very interesting, very involved, very emotional things happening and uh, exciting. And so this book was so very easy to read. And it, it just sort of piqued my interest about who are these people? Who are these people that believed in life, fortune, and sacred honor? Who are these people who believe that it's time for us to stand up for liberty and overthrow a government that we've, the only government we've known for 700 years? And so I picked up another book called 1776 by David McCullough. That's an that excellent book, yeah. Yeah, I totally and completely fell in love with the people who gave us this constitutional republic. I learned that they were more than just 
uh, Samuel Adams and George Washington and Patrick Henry, I learned what an important role the women had in the founding of America, and that you know, and and um, what an important role that minorities and and men and women of color had in the forming of our constitutional republic, and that sort of piqued another interest in me, you know, because I'd been raised in the government school system and raised in believing that all of these things that I'm now finding are not true, that the Constitution prevented women from voting and that the Constitution uh, endorsed and prolonged slavery, that the Constitution called black men property, all of those things are simply not true. And uh, it just drove me to know more because, you know, I have this little thing I hate being lied to. You could do lots of things to me. But don't lie to me. Right. Yeah. And so now I feel like, why have I been lied to about who we are our whole lives? And so I started digging around and I started reading and I realized that, number one, our history books are so horribly tainted with revisionism and agenda that I started putting down the history books and picking up the words of the men and women themselves. Yeah. And it just, oh man, it just opened my eyes and opened the doors to so much truth that I simply did not know and denied. I realized at that point in time that I was not taught the Constitution in law school. I was taught constitutional law, which is completely different than what we know of today as the Constitution. Constitutional law teaches our judges and lawyers that uh, they know more about the Constitution than the men who wrote it, because after all, those guys are dead. And everything that they wrote is irrelevant, you know, because we have cell phones and Internet and CNN and Fox. So we don't need the founders and, and nothing could be further from the truth. And as my studies continued, that, that's where the passion came from, standing up for these people who stood up for us. They said time and time again, we are doing this for ages and millions yet unborn. They didn't pledge life, fortune, and sacred honor for themselves. They did it for us. And, and, and something just stirred in me. These men and women need to be defended. Their sacrifices need to be honored and need to be remembered. I mean, when I'm teaching, I ask people, can you name to me, and, I, and I'll, I'll ask your audience, and you can play along too if you want to. I don't know. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass you or anything. But can you name the first man to die in our liberty movement in the 70s. First man to die, what was his name? And you know, most people I, can't name yeah, him. Yeah, I can't tell you. I know there was, um, oh, the the thing that happened between the British, I can't remember the name of it though, where they, uh, you know, John Adams actually had to defend those British soldiers. Well, but very I can't remember. Good. You're in the right piece of history. <laughs> it's, called, <laughs> it's called the Boston Massacre. Okay. And the man's That's name right. was Boston was Massacre. Crispus Attucks. But see the thing is is Crispus Attucks was a black man. He was a freed slave who had become a whaler for the merchant marines. And his ship just happened to be docked at the Boston port. And while he was below deck, he heard an alarm go off. He ran up deck to put out the fire, because that's usually what an alarm means, uh, but only to find out there was no fire, but that his own government had picked up arms against his own people. And at that time, Crispus Attucks ran back below deck, got 55 of his shipmates, and came out and gave his life for us. Wow. This was a really big deal for them. The Boston Globe did an article about Crispus Attucks' funeral procession said that it was the most attended funeral procession in the history of Boston. They had over 10,000 people wow. at Crispus Attucks funeral procession. A black man. There was a poem written. It says, um, let's see if I can recall it off the top of my head. It's uh, honor to Crispus Attucks, who was leader and voice that day. The first to defy, the first to die with maverick, car, and gray. Call it riot or revolution. His hand first clenched at the crown. His feet were the first in perilous place to pull the king's flag down. His breast was the first one rent apart that liberty's stream might flow. For our freedom now and forever, his head was first laid low. Call it riot or revolution or mob or crowd as you may. Such deaths have been the seed of nations. Such lives shall be honored for a... They thought that we would honor Crispus Attucks forever as the beginning, the first blood to be shed for our liberty. And we don't even know his name. And I, that's, those kinds of little pieces of truth are the things that drive me and help me uh, have this passion because I think I, I'm ashamed. 
I'm ashamed that I never knew who Crispus Attucks was. I'm ashamed that we don't teach this in our schools because we can't possibly let our students know that actually black people fought for our liberty. There were battalions of freed slaves who fought for liberty in America. There were people honored by George Washington, black men honored by George Washington for their sacrifice for our liberty. And we don't know who they are because we have to support some kind of agenda that the Constitution is a racist document. And I think that's shameful. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I think is interesting with the founders and maybe what will help change our paradigm of how we view the Constitution is that these were brand new ideas. I mean, to rule yourself, to be a self-governing type person was kind of an unheard of. We had kings for thousands of years and for thousands of years, government had been a very... George Washington, I think, said it best, and maybe you know quote, the quote better than I do, but that, you know, it's a form of tyranny to have government. And that's when, when they were crafting that document, they were very careful of how they wanted to preserve those rights. I mean, what do you have to say about that, of what they, those founders, you know, experienced and how we can honor them as men that really did have some liberal ideas at the time? that we can't look at them as racist because they didn't get rid of that then and there. Well, here's here's the understanding that is a little bit off center when we teach about the Constitution. There is nothing new or novel in our Constitution. There's nothing new in the Declaration of Independence or the Bill of Rights. These were things not invented by our framers, but things that they had actually pulled from their own history of over 700 years. They had had kings, yes, for a long time, but for the 700 years previous of that, they had a unique form of monarchy called a limited monarchy in which the government the king was actually limited in his power by the will and the uh, liberties of the people. Uh, it started in 1014 with an agreement that they had with their king named Ethelred, in which they, they told Ethelred, we'll allow you to be our king. I mean, this is important. We will allow you to be our king on one condition. Your only job is to negotiate with foreign kings to help us organize for our defense and to engage in treaties of war, peace, and commerce. You will leave us alone to govern ourselves. And then in 1100, we had another king by the name of Henry I who wrote the first installment of the British Constitution called the 1100 Liberty Charters. Uh, the 1100 Charter of Liberties, in which Henry promised that the government would never be evil and oppressive again and made 14 limitations on the power of the king in order to preserve the liberties of the people. In 1215, we get the Magna Carta, which is not the king writing promises, but the people writing demands, demands of what uh, the king can and cannot do and the, the rights and the liberties of the people. From the 1100 Charter of Liberties, we get our principle of separation of church and state. From the Magna Carta, we get our, some more principles of the First Amendment, the right of the people to petition the government for a redress of their grievances. We get our Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, and Eighth Amendments in our Bill of Rights from clauses 38 through 40 in the Magna Carta. We get our representative government from the Magna Carta. It created a committee of 25 men to sit in the king's court who had the authority to tell the king, you can't do what you're doing because it violates the liberties of the people. The third installment is called the Petition of Right of 1628, in which the British citizens demand greater protection for due process. They demand that there'll be no quartering of soldiers in their homes, which is our Third Amendment. And they demand that there'll be no legislation without representation, proper representation. The fourth installment is the Grand Remonstrance of 1641, where it is a, an even greater declaration of the rights of the people, but even more so an identification of tyrannical government. They actually identify what they have observed for 600 years as what tyrannical government looks like. They said tyrannical government, it can be found through corruption of the court system, infiltration of foreign law, the government diminishing the property rights of the people, because even in 1641 they had property rights as people, the government sticking its nose and trying to control the churches. We also have the government 
uh, manipulating the monetary system, creating fiat money, which was considered to them a destruction of liberty, and then the government disarming the people while the government remained armed. Now, this is 1641, mind you, and these are, these are the principles and even sometimes the very language that have been incorporated into our Declaration, our Constitution, and our Bill of Rights. The fifth installment is a document called the English Bill of Rights of 1689, in which they identify that for 600 years, they've had separation of powers. We didn't invent separation of powers. They had a legislative branch and parliament, a judicial branch, and an executive branch and the king. And in 1689, they said, look, you can't violate that separation of powers and maintain liberty. The legislative branch must be limited in its authority. The executive branch must be limited in its authority. And as a matter of fact, one of the things that brought them to the revolution that got the English Bill of Rights was that their executive branch, the king, had taken it upon himself to write law, overturn law, and set aside law, even though that was a power reserved to the legislative branch alone. In 1689, they identified what we call as executive orders today as being the complete destruction of liberty in 1689 and brought them to the point of revolution. And so our Declaration of Independence is not a new document. It's an exercise of Clause 61 of the Magna Carta of 1215. And the grievances that were listed against George III were the same grievances that had been listed against the kings in the four previous documents. It was just the American colonists saying, look, we're British citizens. We have guaranteed rights, and our government is destroying our liberty by refusing to defend our rights and refusing to stand up for us. So we're not going to take this anymore. And our Constitution is a reflection of those five documents as well as the Bill of Rights. So this is something that we have to really grasp a hold of. It's not an invention. It's not something like a new experiment. It is time-tested, blood-brought principles. And what the experiment meant when they said the grand experiment was that we are pulling together the history that we know to be true. And instead of being a kingdom, as we've been for the last hundreds of years, we are now going to not be subjects but free men in a constitutional republic. Let's see what the people can do with that. Because see, with a, with a kingdom, your only remedy against a king is chopping off his head and violent revolution. In a constitutional republic, our remedy is not that. In a constitutional republic, our remedy is the diligence and the vigilance of the people to guard their own liberties through their county commissioners, through their city councilmen, through their sheriff, through their state legislators. Uh, voting is not the defense of liberty. Voting is what you do because you're a member of a constitutional republic. If we think today as Americans that voting is what we do to defend the Constitution, I think that's a good indication of why we have the government that we have today. The defense of liberty was supposed to be every single day, making sure that no government overreaches its boundaries. And, and these are the things that should drive us when we are electing people. Our local governments are way more important than the federal ones. Wow. Well, thank you for setting me straight on that history. That really does make a lot of sense. Like you said, they are time tested principles. And um, we kind of talked before I started recording of how we can use those core books. You'll make the Constitution one of those core books of how we can implement that into our lives. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. When Ben Franklin walked out of the convention, that gave us the Constitution, a woman stopped him on the street and said, Mr. Franklin, what have you done? And Franklin said, we have given you a republic if you can keep it. Changing a paradigm takes some study, but like me, you are probably super busy. That's why we've teamed up with Audible. Go to our website, theluminousmind.net, get a free month of Audible with two audiobooks, thousands of titles in exchange for only books that you absolutely love. You too can be learning on the go to keep that fire burning. We're giving you a republic if you can keep it. We're giving you a republic if you can keep it. The Republic is a representative of democracy, a system dependent on the people alone, not on something else like money given to parliament members. Welcome back to The Luminous Mind with Republic. Chris Ann Hall, who's educating us on the principles of liberty. 
do you feel like that maybe that's the difference between our founders of what they actually understood? They used those. Those were their core beliefs. That was the mm-hmm. way they were educating themselves and, and things they understood. Um, maybe if we can figure out how to get, you know, our populace to use that constitution, you know, what's your message about trying to make that constitution one of our core beliefs? Well, you know, Patrick Henry said that uh, I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that's the lamp of experience. I know no way of judging the future but by the past. Alexander Hamilton said experience is the oracle of truth, and where responses are unequivocal, they ought to be held to be sacred and conclusive. Einstein said just about the same thing. He said, when you do the same things over and over again and expect different results, that's the very definition of insanity. And what these three men are trying to teach us is that history is our greatest teacher. Because human nature never changes, and we end up making the same stupid mistakes over and over again. But when we study our history and we know how we got to where we are, then we understand how to prevent government from ruling and reigning over us as a king. And so our Constitution is not only a declaration of history, but is a declaration of the inalienable rights of the people. Most people will agree of all faiths that there is a specific golden rule that we're supposed to live by, that you do unto others as you do to yourself. And if we are not knowledgeable about our own rights and we do not stand in the defense of others, then we are violating that golden rule. Because what we're saying is, if I knew better and did nothing and allowed my neighbor to suffer from government oppression, is that the way I want to be treated if I'm ignorant of something? Would I want my neighbor in full knowledge to stand by and watch me be assaulted and oppressed by my government when they knew what they could do to change that? But it all begins with education, though, really. Another question that I ask my audiences when I teach is to name all five liberties in the First Amendment, because there are five individual liberties identified in the First Amendment. And, you know, most people cannot name all five. Yeah, actually, let's do number, because most people associate that with the freedom of speech, right? And then, Mm -hmm. then it ends there. What are the five liberties? Well, the five liberties are freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of press, the right to peaceably assemble, and the right to petition the government for a redress of your grievances. See, but if you don't know what your rights are, how do you know they're not already gone? How do you defend something if you don't know it exists? And if you don't know what your rights are, then you are not defending them because you're not exercising them. And the only defense of our rights and our liberties is the daily exercise of those rights. It's when we become ignorant and apathetic. Uh, The apathy comes from ignorance. So when we become ignorant, then all of a sudden we don't care because we don't know we're supposed to care. And then the government can redefine speech and redefine press and redefine things like the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed or redefine the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. All of these things are being redefined by our government today to limit our liberty and expand their power. That is the complete opposite of what our framers intended. Yeah. Well, and one of the things that I loved about the founders when I have studied them is that they may not have all agreed in every situation of what that covered. But one of the things that they did believe in is the willingness to defend each other's rights, you know, Mm -hmm. for life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. I think that's where we really suffer today is that we are allowing ourselves instead of being united in a common goal to preserve each other's rights, we're being divided and separated to be able to to oppress each other in right in different ways that's another thing i mean how do we fight that of allowing ourselves you know keeping ourselves i mean we may disagree in religions we may disagree in abortion or we may disagree in you know what we want to be taxed for what we feel like the government's responsible for um we may disagree with how to get to all that stuff but we need to be you know common and united in liberty how do we 
re- reunite ourselves in that. Samuel Adams said, no people will tamely surrender their liberty nor be easily subdued when knowledge is diffused and virtue is preserved. He said, but on the contrary, when a people become universally ignorant and debauched in their manners, they will sink underneath their own weight without the aid of foreign invaders. And that's what's happening in America. We are being divided by artificial divisions. And when the spirit of liberty, which is within all of us, common to all of us, is what should be uniting us. Our framers had different ideas, not on liberty. They had different ideas on how to preserve it, but they were united in their sense and understanding of liberty that this is what has to happen and this is what we should be focused on. They were singularly focused on these things. And the thing that creates a lot of this division, I think, is this misconception that the Constitution is difficult to understand and that that you have to be a lawyer or a judge to properly interpret it. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Constitution is simply written on purpose. They wrote it simply so that everybody could understand it and everybody could make sure that they were active in its defense and enforcement. There really is very little debate to be had when you read the Constitution and understand its simplicity on what the federal government should and should not be doing. There is a list of things that the federal government is allowed to do, and then the Constitution says everything else that's not on that list is reserved to the states. But because we have taught people for so long, either one of two things, if not both, that it's the Constitution's too difficult to understand, you couldn't possibly understand it, so just leave it to the government, they know best, or that it's outdated and irrelevant, so we don't even really need to understand it, that we've gotten to the point where the government, through its own agencies, through its own branches, has been allowed to expand its own power beyond the limitations of the Constitution because the people have checked out and decided they don't want to know about it. Yeah. Well, and let's bring that back to an education realm. You talked about earlier in our discussion how you felt lied to. And I think a lot of us that went to public school, we were not taught the Constitution or not taught, you know, like you said, more of a constitutional law and not the actual words, what would you say? I Obviously, we attract more homeschoolers than most, and we've realized that maybe that's how our nation will be saved, is that the teaching of the Constitution through the home, because it's not mm-hmm. being done in our government schools, give us an idea of how parents can really mentor that education and learning for their children. Well, I think the first thing may sound strange, but I think the first thing that parents need to do is realize that they don't know what they're supposed to know about the Constitution. Uh, Our forced ignorance on the Constitution, our misunderstandings of government date back generations. And when I teach, I teach people of all ages from 6 to 96. And it is it is universal, the lack of understanding on what the Constitution means and how it's supposed to be applied. And so I think the first thing is to admit that we as adults need a re-education program on what the Constitution means and how it's supposed to work. And once we can get a real foundational understanding, and I mean it's just simple, ABCs, 123s of the Constitution, then we can start sharing that information or perhaps even be willing to learn alongside our children as we find reasonable and reliable resources to teach on the Constitution and how it's supposed to work. Because you have to be very careful. This misinformation, this misteaching has gone back so far that even sources that we might consider as reliable are simply not because we have been indoctrinated into a federal supremacy kind of attitude, a judicial supremacy attitude. We say things like courts make rulings as if they write law and that the Supreme Court is the final authority on the Constitution. And and those things are simply not true. And so you have to be very discerning about the sources that you use. And I think the beginning would be to simply pick up the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers and sit down and use them as a, as a teaching tool with the students, realizing that 
they are a little difficult to read. The grammar is a little bit more complex than what we're used to. And they talk about things that we simply don't know because we don't teach the history that we're supposed to be taught. And so I think the best advice would be is to start with the Federalist Papers or the Anti-Federalist Papers because you have to read them both to understand the full scope of the debate. But use them not as a reading text but as a study text and spend a week or so on one paper. And so when you get to something that you don't understand, perhaps Hamilton speaks of a person that you don't know, you stop right there in that document and you go on the internet and you Google that person and you learn what you need to know about that person or that event in history. Uh, I know they talk about April 19th. So what happened on April 19th? Well, that's another good history lesson. Go back and Google and find out what happened on April 19th, 1776. And uh, learn about Hobbes and Algernon and Montesquieu and, and Locke and these knowledges that we lack that drive our ignorance. Uh, people say they can't understand the Federalist Papers. It's not because they're written in Russian. It's because they're written in English, but in a knowledge that we no longer hold. Yeah. Our you know, education is so definitely dumbed down. To yeah. That. So, so that's what we need to do. We need to accept that we don't know and start learning from the beginnings. Now, for reference purposes, my website, chrisannhall.com, we have lots of resources available. Uh, I have taken some of the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist Papers and created articles and, and show you how they apply and how the history works and how the Constitution works in more of our layman's modern day terms. I have videos. I have books that I've written. I have two children's books that I've written. One is called Bedtime Stories for Budding Patriots that teaches non-readers. It's a read-to-me book. And the other one is called Essential Stories for Junior Patriots. That's for our high school, middle school students. See, every chapter has study questions at the end, so it's really a homeschool tool. And it helps our parents learn alongside. And, and once we start planting that little seed, then I believe that it will happen to others as it happened to me. Yeah. Well, one of the cool things that we've done with our students, as I've informed my listeners before, I'm teaching a constitutional and a declaration type class, is that we've actually had them write it in their own words of what that means to them. And mm -hmm. hopefully that will help them want to use that as a core document, you know, for mm -hmm. their personal use of how they can relate that whatever that's saying to themselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you recommend as far as, you know, your own studying and writing goes on that? Do you have I any think, tips like yeah, that? Yeah, I think that it would be good for them to understand what it meant to the men who wrote it. And then, because that's the basis for understanding. It's not what we think it means today or how we feel about it today that's it's really important. What's really important is what it meant when it was written. Because the Constitution is a contract, and the meaning of the contract is not derived by future application. The meaning of the contract is derived from those who wrote the contract and designated its meanings and applications. And so I think it would be an interesting study tool that after they do their what does it mean to me to understand what it really meant to them uh, so we can understand how different we are today but how the same we are as well, that these principles of liberty never change and that some things are still important uh, today, that they're not so different from us. Yeah, that's actually, I've never thought about that. That's a great way of having a better understanding of it yourself is to figure out what they were thinking back then. So thank you. Now, as far as like, I think, I don't know if other people in the world are feeling this way, but an over general feeling is, you know, we're feeling very uh, distraught about, you know, what's going on. We're seeing those liberties slip away from us all over the place and um, we're losing those. Um, I'm, I live here in the West and our land, you know, is, is being taken by federal governments all the time. You know, give us some success things of what you've seen with your message. I mean, are we seeing an upsurge in people interested in, I mean, since you're out there, you know, teaching and, and um, on your show and everything, tell us maybe some successes, give us some hope of what we can see in the future. Well, I teach about 265 lessons in over 22 states every single year. And just a very 
a conservative estimate. We guessed that I taught from January to October of last year over 40,000 people. So I am seeing a lot of people and teaching a lot of people. And what I, I am seeing a hope. We're seeing people becoming educated on the Constitution and then running for office. We are watching sheriffs stand up in defense of the people's property against the federal government. We're watching states craft legislation to put federal government back in its limited to find box. And it's happening exponentially now where, you know, maybe five, 10 years ago, it was just one or two here and there. Now, because yeah, you almost seem like the nut job if you talked about it, you know. Yeah, right. But now we're seeing it. I mean, we're becoming more educated on what exactly is the role of the pastors and uh, role of our sheriffs and role of our school board and our uh, legislators and our county commissioners, our city councilmen, we're getting an upsurge of, of this re-education on what is their roles. And so it's just a matter of understanding, like I said, and teaching. And we're watching this happen. Great. Thank you. I guess I'll ask you what your long-term visions and goals are for yourself and maybe some of the services that you offer. You talked about some books that you had and scores of material that we can get from you. You know, give us more information on some of those things and what your long-term goals are in the future. Okay. Well, we... Our, our goals are always the same. We just want to spread this education of liberty and the uh, proper role in, of the federal government, the proper role of the state and the local governments and the limited nature and the proper application of the Constitution. And uh, we are teaching more and more people. So our goal is to reach more and more people. To uh, We're teaching high school, middle school students, college students, adult groups. We're teaching uh, religious liberties in churches. We're teaching teaching state legislators. We're teaching uh, law enforcement. My law enforcement class has been approved in Texas as continuing education credit hours for their sheriffs and deputies. I've taught the legislators of Arizona, Utah, Kansas, Missouri, um, Idaho, and Oregon. And we have even more states lined up to teach. And we're actually going to be teaching some of the same legislators again because you don't get it the first time around. But we'd love to see parents teaching their children. We'd love to see more groups, homeschool groups, embracing this knowledge of the Constitution and its proper application. So our goal is just simply to educate and liberate the people into the sense and understanding, proper sense and understanding of liberty. That's wonderful. And do you have like a schedule on your website that could show people where they could go to maybe hear you speak? I mean, you're speaking all over the country, correct? Yes, all over the country. Yes. On my website, chrisannhall.com, there's a calendar. Also, there is a place where you can sign up to have me come and teach your group. We don't charge speaking fees. And we don't require anybody to compensate us for our expenses. We, we work solely on donation. We work solely on, the, on what we get from the books that I've written. And uh, we have people who, who donate to us on a regular basis because they love the knowledge that we're teaching. And so uh, all you have to do is sign up on the website and my assistant, Janet, will get in touch with you and she will help find a date that works for everybody and I will come and teach. That's wonderful. Like I did. I did that with right. you for this podcast. Right. Awesome. All right. Well, before we say goodbye, do you have any final parting words for our listeners? And then please give us your contact information of how we can get your resources. History is your best teacher. And history is also, I mean, it, it gives you sometimes some things that you don't want to know, some things that are unpleasant to see. But as Patrick Henry said, as for me, I would like to know the whole truth, good or bad, so that I can be prepared for it. But history also gives us hope. It shows us that in our constitutional history, men and women have fought for liberty. And every time they stood in unity for liberty, they won. And every time they won, limited government was the result and greater liberty for the people was what they enjoyed. And we move from a kingdom mentality to a constitutional republic where all men are created equal, where we have equal representation and we are not subjects to government. We have rights and not privileges. And so we need to be encouraged 
by the fact that that history repeats in the same way every single time. And once we get educated on the proper role of government and realize just how far out of whack we've become, we will be able to stand up and do what's right and necessary. And uh, so, again, I have a radio show that broadcasts six days a week. You can uh, download my mobile app onto your iPhone or your Android phone and get my shows podcasted to your phone. You can Bluetooth them through your car and, and get the education from an everyday perspective. I have books that are available. I have articles. I have over 150 articles and videos on my website. All of these things with just the hope to plant a little seed that will inspire others to stand for liberty as well. That is great. And I definitely want to, you know, encourage people to try to look at our founding documents as, you know, timeless principles. I think that's where we're really not seeing how we can utilize those for our day and our age and that they will work if we can get back to that limited government mm -hmm. and those principles. So thank you so much, Chris, and for coming on. It has been an absolute pleasure to speak with you and I appreciate your time. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for being a homeschooling parent. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Chris Ann Hall, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and get our new monthly newsletter. Then check out our services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of inspiring content, go to the Sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us, leave us a review, share our content, tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education.